the Knights of Columbus Free Radio School in New York, where some hundred odd students, most of them ex-servicemen, are learning the theory and operation of radio apparatus. Mr. L. W. Meekins Broadcasting Foreign Inquiries from WGI, Medford, Massachusetts. A Swiss firm wants to buy 10,000 electric light sockets, is the report. Next morning, the U.S. Bureau of Foreign and Domestic Commerce has scores of applications for the name and address of the Swiss importer. The Department of Agriculture explains its radio service, showing how people living on farms or in remote districts can profit from the crop and market reports. The announcer's booth installed by the engineers of the American Telephone and Telegraph Company. On the flagpole just above the booth will be noticed one of the microphones used for picking up cheering. The amplification which the output of these cheering microphones undergoes can be varied at will. When the announcer is silent, the volume of cheering can be run up, and then diminished before an announcement is made. A typical telephone repeater installation, as used on long-distance telephone lines. Repeaters such as are here shown are also used for the remote control of WEAF when broadcasting the games between Brown and Yale, Princeton and Harvard, Yale and Princeton, and Harvard and Yale. Getting the game play-by-play, -play, a crowd gathering around a loudspeaker in Park Row, New York City. The input of the loudspeaker was supplied from a radio receiving set located on the truck. On the upper left-hand corner of the truck may be seen a small loop antenna for receiving. Way down yonder in the cornfield, where radio has entered the field of agriculture. This station, built by the Connecticut Agricultural College, Stores, Connecticut, will be used for broadcasting information of an agricultural nature. The first amateur transatlantic station. It was built in less than two weeks and operated by, left to right, E.V. Amy, John Grinnan, the first amateur to send directly across the U.S., George Berghard, E.H. Armstrong, inventor of regeneration and super-regeneration, and Minton Cronkite. Edwin H. Armstrong, explaining the principles of his latest invention, super-regeneration, at a meeting of the Radio Club of America, held in Columbia University, New York City. Eddie Cantor entertains about 2,000 people a night when he appears before Broadway audiences. In a single evening before the microphone, he entertained more people than he did in an entire season on the stage. May Peterson, the noted soprano of the Metropolitan Opera Company, has favored the invisible audience with her singing, and we may say with no fear of contradiction that she has been heard by more than 100,000 people in a single evening when she sang at WJZ. Mrs. W. E. McAdams and Miss Murtis, well known in Georgia before radio broadcasting became so popular as an indoor sport, now have made many friends among the listeners in in almost every state in this large country of ours, through WSB. V. A. Randall is one of those men of mystery who tell you what the next number is to be, and who is going to perform. Mr. Randall is studio manager of WEAF, and his voice has been heard in thousands of homes. Signal stations like this are valuable in communicating with planes in flight and for instructional purposes. The remote station in the Sierra Madre Mountains which will keep the workers in touch all winter with headquarters in the outside world. Putting their headquarters station on the map. Boy Scouts of Troop 1, Roslyn, Long Island, using a loop receiver to determine the position of their transmitting station at troop headquarters. Bearings taken from two or more locations are plotted on the map, and the point where these direction lines meet indicates the position of the transmitting station. The highest radio station in the world. The site is the peak of Mount Corcovado, 2,100 feet above the city of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Workmen erecting the aerials experienced many thrills, when the slightest misstep would have meant a plunge to the depths below. A push cart set. One of these Kansas City scouts is pulling on a guy rope fastened to a mast made of scout poles lashed together. A receiver that cost 21 cents. 2FP, sometimes used by David Talianoff, whose fist is well known to amateurs. This station has been heard in every state and far beyond the boundaries of the continent. 
The best known radio station in the world, NAA, Arlington, Virginia, whose distinctive spark note is heard every noon and evening by thousands of people, both afloat and ashore, who tune in to keep posted on the time, news, and weather. The hub of the radio universe. Mr. R. H. G. Matthews, known to hams as Maddie, is here shown operating the hub, which is so called because, located in Chicago, it is a clearinghouse for amateur messages in all directions. John A. Gelhog's new station, located in Baudette, Minnesota. This picture was taken November 27, 1922. The aerial is out of the way under the top. With this portable set, Mr. Gelhog has heard longwave arc stations hundreds of miles away with a single tube. While the car was making 25 miles an hour, he has copied signals from a spark coil transmitter using 12 watts input up to 5 miles. Mr. Gowan's station in Ossining, New York. The tube transmitter, mounted on the upright panel at the right, is used for broadcasting and has been heard all over the country. Some broadcast enthusiasts procure elaborate apparatus for the purpose of getting the distant stations. In a receiver of this type, there are entirely too many adjustments for the ham to bother with, especially where rapid DX, long distance relay, work is carried on. The station of Harold Robinson at Keyport, New Jersey. When built, the transmitting apparatus of 2QR was of better design than that employed on most commercial vessels. However, spark transmitters are rapidly going into the discard in favor of the continuous wave system. The tube transmitter which supplanted the one shown at the left in this picture was heard in Aberdeen, Scotland. Where the west begins and the tall corn grows. The stuffed birds hovering near the ceiling, the bits of wisdom stenciled on the walls, and the rustic furnishings give this music studio of the Palmer School of Chiropractic in Davenport, Iowa an unusual appearance to say the least. The attractive studio at WHN, a low-powered station at Ridgewood, Long Island. The immaculate operating room at PWX, Havana, Cuba. Operating room at the Los Angeles Times Station. Listening to Cuba from Cuba A Sunday crowd gathered about the grocery and liquor store at San Jose de las Lajas, a Four Corners 25 miles from Havana, to see their first radio set and hear their first concert broadcasted by station PWX of the Cuban Telephone Company. The announcer at a church service has an inconspicuous position. The cabinet beside him controls the system of microphones, which are located at various points in the church, and also the degree of amplification used for each selection. He is in communication with the broadcasting station by telephone, and he listens into the service as it is broadcasted by means of a local receiving set. Broadcasting dance music from a place where there is dancing. Vincent Lopez's well-known orchestra in the Hotel Pennsylvania Grill Room is heard twice a week by WJZ's audience. Governor Channing H. Cox of Massachusetts, broadcasting from WGI, the American Radio and Research Corporation station at Medford Hillside, Massachusetts. Dr. Ernest M. Styers, whose sermons have been transmitted by wire from St. Thomas's Church, New York, to WJZ, and from there sent out to a huge radio congregation. Tita Rufo singing at the first of the concerts from the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Mr. H. B. Thayer talking to London from New York. Rear Admiral C. P. Plunkett, U.S. Navy through whose courtesy a series of monthly concerts is being broadcasted from station NAH at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The station operates on a wavelength of 507 meters. Admiral Plunkett is here shown at WJZ, Newark, New Jersey. Out of the studio broadcasting in the Japanese capital. The Viscount Shibusawa addressing a vast crowd in Hibiya Park, Tokyo. The Twelve Towers at Rocky Point, Long Island. These towers carry the antennas used in transmitting to European stations. The power which radiates from the antennas is controlled by delicate mechanism in New York City, 55 miles away. A view of the control station at Broad Street, New York City. In the foreground is a modified typewriter keyboard used in conjunction with a perforating machine, which punches out dots and dashes on the tape. 
The tape is later fed into an automatic transmitter which controls the key circuit of the transatlantic transmitter according to the dots and dashes on the tape. The U.S. Naval Radio Station at Jupiter Inlet, Florida. 2FZ, one of the most elaborate amateur stations in existence. The entire station, with its myriad switches, motor generators, dynamotors, tubes, and batteries, is at the fingertips of the operator, who may affect 101 different combinations of apparatus without rising from his chair. The map which flashes the position of various stations. The illuminated map of the United States is, to the layman, perhaps the most interesting feature of Station 2FZ. With a flip of a telephone switch on the control box, the coastlines become dotted with dark green lights indicating the ship shore commercial stations. Another switch is thrown and red lights flash the position of the naval stations, and the constellation is completed by a sparkle of white dots, the broadcasting stations. WGI, the American Radio and Research Corporation station at Medford Hillside, Massachusetts. The 100-watt transmitter, shown at the right, has been heard in Kansas, Texas, and Cuba. The studio at KDZE, Rhodes Department Store, Seattle, Washington. A wall of plate glass allows shoppers to see the broadcasting in progress. The Holmeses of Preston, Ontario, with their homemade set. Miss Harriet Williams at PWX. When she was playing recently from the Havana station, her mother, listening in at Toledo, Ohio, heard the program clearly. And more remarkable still, when Miss Williams also sang at PWX the same evening, she was heard in Douglas, Alaska, 3,500 miles away. Station personnel at WJZ, Newark, New Jersey. The wave from Lake Erie. He rolls in from WJAX, the Union Trust Company's station in Cleveland. In private life, the wave is E.G. Johnson. He has a deep bass voice which, it is reported, knocks him dead all the way from the Atlantic coast to the Mississippi, and from Nova Scotia to Cuba.